and the greatest of these is love. I expect most of us are familiar with this passage from 1 Corinthians 13, and I imagine there's a number of us here who might even say it's one of our favorite passages in Scripture. But it's become so familiar to many of us that I wonder if some of us can no longer really hear what it's saying. We see it so often, it's on greeting cards, and have you ever received a greeting card with this passage on it, but then you just turn past it to see what the personal note is inside. It becomes a context for beautiful cursive and scroll work and the like. We look past it. And so part of the problem may simply be the word love. Now, we don't fully hear this overplayed passage because in some ways, it can seem sentimental. Love describes a nice person, and it also can seem a little soft. It's a cliche, but we often believe it. Nice guys finish last. So most of us know otherwise. I think we all do. And we feel love. So we need to define this word, love, in such a way that we can fully receive this passage. Now, many of you may be familiar with the fact that Greek has several words for love. C.S. Lewis has his famous book, The Four Loves, where he describes the Greek words for love, and he simply put, let's just look at four of them in, in turn. He describes storge as familial love within that family bond, philios as brotherly love, eros romantic love, and these Lesser loves are all given order by agape, which is gift love. And that's the word that Paul uses here in this passage. Now, this mostly describes the love of God, who is love because all that we have is pure gift. So God's love is most of all agape. The closest English word we have for this is charity. But I don't think it really works for us because that word charity actually has too narrow of a semantic domain for us right now. It's often described with those who help in a soup kitchen or serve those who are lesser than them in the world's eyes. So we're left with the word love. And here, Paul is painting a picture of that agape love and giving it a new semantic domain that describes nothing less than the whole person of Christ. So in the biblical understanding of the human person, the emotions and the intellect operate together. This is the Hebrew understanding of the heart as describing the whole volition of the human person. And this is distinct from the pagan Greek understanding, by the way, which sees the intellect and the emotions as separate. So Paul here is presenting love in the context of this Hebrew understanding of the Hebrew person, of, of the human person, rather, in which the extent of your love describes who you are, the depth of your personality. But we have a way of compartmentalizing love from other aspects of life. Think of times when you've seen yourself as using your head without love. Or if you've spoken about politics apart from love. Or even if, how you've thought about news from across the world. Is there love in that? Now, if you think of someone who actually integrates all of this together consistently, they're different, aren't they? Well, that's what it means to be truly Christ, his representative in the world. 
So we're going to consider what is new about this passage that the world has not seen before, at least not before hearing these words. Love, of course, is a universal concept. But what is true about the way St. Paul describes love that couldn't be true about atheists or Hindus or even most Jews. Well, the context of this passage is Paul talking about the gifts that you and I have been given as part of the body of Christ. This, however, love, is the gift that orders everything else. So you aren't accurately representing Christ if love is absent. In fact, you lack integrity as a Christian if love is absent in any of your actions or judgments. So love, in short, is understood as the person of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, then the person of our Lord Jesus Christ is worth infinitely more. He is the image of God. And as we read in 1 John, God is love. As Benedict XVI says in his encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, God is love. Everything has its origin in God's love. Everything is shaped by it. I'm quoting him directly. Everything is directed towards it. We become less whole if we resist this, but we only become whole if we embrace this. So also in 1 John, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an expiation for our sins. We are able to give love only because we have received love. You have become part of his body and endued with his strength to give in his name. So, what God does is he meets what C.S. Lewis calls the more minor need loves. Because he meets your needs, you are able to give. And this affects not only what you do, but also how you perceive other fallen, self-absorbed people around you who are in desperate need of Christ's love. So St. Paul paints the picture of agape love in this passage. He expands that semantic domain for love by relating it to many qualities. And let's hear some of them directly from this passage. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love endures all things. Like light refracted into many colors, all these qualities flow from that white light, which is God's agape love. So when you use the word love to describe who you are called to be in Christ, it is charged with all this imagery all the time. So now let's look at the passage and consider some of Paul's points in turn. Love is patient, love is kind. Kindness gets in the way when you're busy, doesn't it? There are places to go and people to meet. But let's remember that all this busyness will pass away. But love, Paul tells us, will never end. And your acts of kindness will remain forever. To this end, I'd like to share with you a little illustration about when I was at the end of summer camp after fifth grade. My friend and I were reminiscing 
with our counselor in the cabin just be while we were waiting for our parents to pick us up. And for the first time, I really felt a connection with this counselor as we talked about the two weeks past. But then he came to himself and he said, all right, I've got places to go and people to meet. Come on, let's, let's move on. Let's go back to the parent waiting area. Now, I rem remember this like it was yesterday. And I didn't fault him for having other things to do. In fact, I felt a little embarrassed for taking up too much of his time. But the way he said this told me that he didn't really care about me or my friend. Now, as Proverbs tells us, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But imagine if he had said it just a little bit different. If he had just said, you know, I really love to keep on talking this way, but unfortunately I've got, a, I've got other things to do. So let's just head over to the parent waiting area right now. It would have made a huge amount of difference. And so Samuel Johnson famously wrote, the measure of man is how he treats someone who can do him absolutely no good. This points us to agape love, gift love, the love of God who made us even though we add nothing to him and what's more, gave himself to redeem us. So we have a Christian way of having places to go and people to meet. Prophecy can seem more important than people. But prophecy, Paul tells us, is partial and it will pass away. But love, patience, kindness, this never ends. And those small acts of love will be remembered eternally. So let's consider another point from this passage. Love is not boastful or arrogant or rude. These points get to the three root causes of our sin, beyond pleasure to vanity and pride. These three things, all of us gravitate to one of the three, and that is a source of most of our sin. But love conquers this. If your boasting is conquered, then vanity is conquered. And I'm not just talking about external boasting, but the internal self-talk matters too. So there's value in isolating sins and categorizing them as is so characteristic of our Catholic scholastic tradition. But if you've done this before, and if you have, you've found that a valuable exercise, but who can remember all those categories of virtues and vices in the moment? Instead, you can simply ask, is there love? Is there love in me right now? And this is the white light that always shines the truth of Christ. Paul continues, love bears all things. Now, how can that be true of us? St. John Chrysostom translates this simply as, love puts up with everything. That describes the cross in every aspect of life. Being willing to suffer inconvenience without annoyance and deference to others who are needy, even as you do all you can to move them to greater holiness. Your complaining and scowl will not change them your love, however, will. Love believes all things, hopes all things. In other words, love receives the resurrection. Just because you live to give doesn't mean you don't rest. Quite the opposite. You receive God's gift in order to be the gift. If you refuse God's love and refuse to believe that God will meet your own deepest needs, then you won't be able to pass on his love to others. 
And it has been this way since the beginning. But now we have the kingdom that Jesus has brought us. And this expands and deepens our understanding of love in light of his person and his, of our Lord Jesus Christ and his spirit that lives in us. This is the difference of the Our Father prayer that our Lord taught us. So now, why couldn't a Muslim or Jew pray the Our Father the way we do? After all, in interfaith gatherings, people tend to address God generically as Our Father. But when we pray, Thy kingdom come, we are infusing that with Christian meaning. We are saying, that love came down from heaven as a gift in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are called to manifest that gift by bringing forward God's love as we receive his forgiveness and then pass it on to others. When we ask God to forgive us our trespasses and we forgive those who trespass against us, we are praying something that is only possible because of this new and deeper understanding that we have of God's love in our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is something that defines us anew. So we are a people who care about truth, truth that is theological and public and personal, truth about God, truth in public policy, truth in terms of whether or not you have been personally done right or wrong by others. Pope Benedict wrote in Lumen Fide, which was drafted by him, love and truth are inseparable. One who loves realizes that love is an experience of truth, and it opens our eyes to see reality in a new way, in union with the beloved. So if in any situation love is lacking, then your integrity as a Christian is lacking. For this reason, an effective examination of conscience at night can be simply, in what that transpired today did I not have love? So you can do this every night for a week. Do it when you're brushing your teeth as a marker so you don't forget. And see how this changes how you think of yourself in real time. You'll begin to wonder as you interact with others, do I have love? And it will begin to change how you manifest Christ in the world. Love in Christ directs everything in the life of a well-formed Christian. There are no barriers, no brackets, in which something can be separate from love. Christ directs everything in love towards you. So let's receive his love sacramentally as we are strengthened to live as part of the body of Christ.